message is entitled, Set Your Hearts. Beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Amen. What is it that occupies your greatest thoughts and your highest aspirations? Paul's writing to the Colossians intentionally turns a corner. He's been speaking of theological topics, great and wonderful, high and lofty ideals, and confronting the uh, inappropriate theology that was beginning to surface in that region of the world. He sought to bring out the false teachings into the open where they could be examined in the full light of the gospel of Christ. There are good many things that seem to be valuable and wise in the darkness. I don't know if you've all ever had those occasions. It seems like more than once in the middle of the night, something seemed like it was a good thing to do. And then by the light of the next morning, you realize that ah, wasn't so good at all. Yeah. Hopefully we've outgrown those days of making rash decisions in the middle of the night. <clears throat> when they are exposed to the full light of day, Paul has exposed these teachings to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were found to be worthless or worthless than the gospel was. Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples, compared the kingdom of heaven to a man who found great treasure. It was buried in a piece of property. And this, Jesus said, that man went and sold everything that he had and went and bought that piece of property because of the treasure that was buried there. In his classic story, Acres of Diamonds, <coughs> Russell Conwell tells about Al-Hafid who heard the stories from a uh, monk traveling through about diamonds, sparkling rocks that were so beautiful. And Al-Hafid became so enamored with the idea of diamonds that he went and sold his great property and holdings and he spent all of the rest of his years searching for those diamonds. Eventually, he was broke and in despair, and he threw himself from the ship into the ocean. In the meantime, the man who bought Al Hafid's property was taking his camel out to the stream to water. And there he saw a sparkling something at the bottom in the sand. And he picked it up, and there, encased in rock, was a diamond. And he, he moved some of the sand away from in the stream bed, and there were more and more precious, valuable diamonds. al who was enamored with the search for diamonds, had acres of diamonds. Already, he just didn't know what they were. al gave it away everything he had to search the world to find what he had never noticed right under his feet, the acres of diamonds. Uh, Russell Cornwell first printed that story in 1890, and he used the, the profits that he made from traveling the world, telling the story and encouraging people not to look somewhere else for what is wonderful, but to look often in their own backyard. He used the money that he made from telling that story to build Temple University, and what is today the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. <coughs> if we're not careful, we'll spend our time chasing.
chasing after the latest fad in Christendom and will miss the riches that are ours in our backyard in those Bibles that we have sitting on the shelf and laying on the stand next to the bed and, and we've just neglected to pick up and read. The Bible is the Word of God and it contains everything we need for life and godliness. Now some people would question, is it really, Pastor, does it have everything we need for life and godliness? Well, if you can give me a situation in life that the Bible doesn't address, I'll give you a man. And yet I believe that every situation that you and I will ever face is found in Scripture and the answers to all of the greatest questions, especially in life, but even to the small questions in life, are found there. Other books may deepen our understanding of the Bible, but they should never replace the Bible as our source and our supply. Although we may enjoy the benefits of living in a world with uh, YouTube sermons and Facebook devotions, some of them are great. Some of them are wonderful. These should never replace the Bible as our source or our inspiration either. And if ever one of the other sources, and they're going to, one of these other sources should ever contradict the Bible, allow the Bible to have the first place. We should take everything that the scriptures speak seriously. And whatever someone else tells us, take with a grain of salt. After all, Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. Let's look then at this idea of setting our hearts on the things that are above, rather than on the things that that are below. The things that are below might be compared to chasing for the gold at the end of the rainbow. You know about the, the legend of there being gold at the end of the rainbow, right? When I was a kid, we, we were told that story growing up. Go to the end of the rainbow and there you'll find a treasure. And we kept wondering where the end of the rainbow was. Where's and we would see one, and we would go off in the distance, and we would drive, and it always seemed to be moving with us. It wasn't until I got to be an adult that I realized, and, and Rex, someone pointed out to me, that the rainbow is a circle. And that we only see part of it because of the limitations of the sky. The rainbow doesn't have Far too often, we overlook the potential of the things that are right in front of us, and we search for the gold at the end of the rainbow. We're looking for the leprechaun sitting there on top of the pot. Men, we're especially susceptible to always wanting more and not being satisfied with what we have. I know we, we claim that the ladies are the ones who are always shopping for shoes and dresses and outfits, but uh, we just have different kinds of toys that we like. They're usually more expensive, and we always like to have one as nice as or nicer than the guy next door. We covet our neighbor's success and lust after the bigger house or the fancier car. Oftentimes we're dissatisfied uh, for good reason and with great motivation. You know, sometimes we simply want what's best for our wife and our family. And so we chase after the better thing. You know, if, if having everything that this world desires does not equate to happiness. Possessions don't make us happy. 
fact, study after study demonstrates that some of the happiest people on earth are those who lack material possessions. We become victims of the consumer mentality. The world tells us that this one is the latest and the greatest version and you need to have one. You need it, they say. You need it. Watch TV and commercials. Listen to the radio. They'll tell you that you need it. And some of you are smart enough to say, you know, we got along without it for a long time. We may not need it. And then they chime in, you want it. We know you do. You want this. And they whet your appetite for it. And then finally, and this one is the one that perhaps makes me the craziest, they say, you deserve it. <coughs> Listen, I deserve a lot of things in this world, and most of them I don't get because the grace of God has intervened. Amen. Deserve the latest, greatest gadget? I might want it. I might need it. Deserving is something of a higher level to deserve. If we can get along with less or cheaper, more reliable methods or means, what could we do with the difference? What difference could we make in this world if it wasn't all about us. If we had really set our hearts on the things above and not on the earthly things. Living cheaply is good for our future. It allows us to store up for a rainy day, as Grandma used to say. But it's also good for our ability to do good for others. Brother Jeff Hancock, in uh, one of his presentations this week at Camp Dixon, said uh, the best way to spell love is T-I-M-E. Amen. I'm so glad that you've come to spend time with your families, those who have come specially to be here. It says more just to spend time with this is equally true with our families and with the Lord. See, God made us for relationships. And it's in those relationships and those communities where we flourish best. Our families are better off when mom and dad are both physically and emotionally present in day-to-day -day activities. Now listen, you can be physically present without being emotionally present. And physically present is better than being absent. Being both is the best. Deep, abiding relationships make for the best kids. Having the latest, greatest game system, TV, whatever, doesn't make our kids better kids. Having close relationships with their parents, and with adults that they respect, and we respect them as well. Modern Christianity is not exempt from the consumer culture, and apparently ancient Christianity was not exempt from it either. Instead of grabbing hold of the firm foundation of Jesus that was laid for them by the faithful teaching of Ephesus and of Paul for him, the Colossian Christians were abandoning the truth in favor of the latest, latest fad and the most fashionable philosophy. You know, we can, we can try and be so fashionable with the world that we lay aside the Scripture and it comes in so easily and so gently that we don't even realize that we've put it off and put it to the side. This was the case for many of the beliefs that were circulating in Colossia. We 
You see, there aren't really any special revelations. They're just revelations. They're for everyone. There are no special diets for Christians. Now, you might find some benefit in a special diet, and if your doctor has told you to stay away from this or to start eating more of that, there may be some physical benefits for it, but... Paul says, the idea of touch, not touching this or not tasting that, it doesn't have any place in Christianity. There are few benefits from adopting a Spartan lifestyle. Starving ourselves to death. Not the best thing for us. And there are no benefits at all from worshiping angels or powers, or other heavenly beings. Jesus is the only one that matters. He is the first and the last. He is the foremost. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one that holds the creation together, and He is the one that is coming back to redeem us finally forever. He is the most prominent one of all of heaven and earth. We should set our minds on the things that pertain to and are of importance to Jesus. Amen. Those are the things that will last. Paul says, we have died to the things of this world. Now we understand we need the things in this world while we're here. But like the human philosophies that circulate, they are of little use to us in understanding Him. Jesus told His listeners in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the other things that you need will be added to you as well. And now Paul is telling the young church same thing. Set your mind on the things of heavenly value and not simply on human wisdom. It's not that we need to unnecessarily withhold anything of value or the latest gadgets from our family as long as we understand that we can't buy love with them. We can't buy respect because of them. But they should enhance our relationships but they should not define our relationships. When Christ appears, the real hazard, I suppose, is that if we're always chasing after the temporal and the earthly, the temporary, then how will we respond when all of the temporary stuff is gone? In what do we put our hope and our faith if our money or our possessions evaporate? What if everything is wiped away in a flood or a tornado or another hurricane retreat? Where is our hope if our hope is in things that rot and rust and decay and can be stolen and taken away? Set your minds on the things above and not on the earth. Where is our hope if we put our money in the bank and the bank fails? Where is our hope if our mind and our attention have been on the worldly things and Jesus comes and the scripture says that when he comes, that this world and everything in it, the elements will all be burned away. When he evaporates all the world in his judgment, where will our hearts be? Will they be looking back on the things that we've lost? Or will they be looking up, knowing that we've gained Jesus who is more than all we could ever ask? from this world to provide. Our minds should be set on the things above. 
Our hearts should be pleasing to God and not merely keeping up with the Joneses. One day Jesus is returning to this earth. The scripture speaks of that day and says that the dead in Christ will be raised to their reward. And the ungodly will be raised to judgment and the second death. And those who are living will be welcomed by him at his coming. Or they will be sent in fear, asking for the rocks to fall on them. Where will our hope and confidence be if it is in the elemental things of this world? By contrast, where is our reward? If we place it in Him and above. What if the kingdom is our top priority for our lives now? There is some practical implications with this. Set your mind on things above does not mean that we think and talk only about heaven. You know, there have you ever met one of those folks that only talks about heaven? It doesn't mean that we abandon all the joyous events on this earth or all of our human relationships. We don't have to throw out everything that the world offers. Just don't put it as first, the primary. Setting our minds on the things above doesn't mean that we have to quit having fun with our friends or fellowship with our family. Setting our minds on the things above means doesn't mean that we have to refrain from tasting good food. We still need to be fed doesn't mean that we have to stop smelling the roses along the road of life. They were created by God as well. Let's just remember the source of all the good things that come. It does mean, however, that the world and the things of the world hold a lesser place when compared to our thoughts and efforts in building and keeping a secure relationship Jesus. It should mean for us that every thought and every activity and every relationship, every interaction carries with it the weight of eternity. For us to ask ourselves a question, how does my attitude reflect the truth of Jesus and His power and authority? How do my interactions with others demonstrate that Jesus is my source and my supply? If we're always running around like Chicken Little, claiming that the sky is falling, how will people know what a big God we have? And how can we structure our day so that we can accomplish the work that is given to us? And the labors that we have to do, and that somehow at the end of the day, God gets the glory. Perhaps for me, the greatest revelation from uh, Dixon Camp meeting came again from Brother Jeff Hancock. He asked us if we were living self centered lives or God. You see, it's, it's possible to seek God with a wrong motive, only wondering what we may receive from Him. And even though we're looking to Him, it's still about us. What does He have for me? What can I get from Him? What blessing do I request from God today? Seeking God means that we change our focus. Rather, we should ask, what does God desire of me? What may I bring to God today? How can God use me today? And what is God doing in the world, and how can I help Him accomplish His purpose? And this parallels our message 
you will. We don't have to spend our lives as spiritual infants, always looking to receive some temporal benefit from God. We don't have to arrive at church on Sunday morning wondering what God will give us today, but maybe we arrive wondering what we may give Him. We can choose to focus our heart and our mind on the things above and ask what God wants, what God desires. How can I participate in Thy kingdom? Pray that prayer. As Jesus gave us the example, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But not so that it's all on you, God, but how can I help your kingdom come? How can I help your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We can set our hearts on the things above and not simply on the earthly things. Not simply on some new teaching or some new vision, but on the revelation that has already been given. And it is really sufficient for all we need. Revealed to us in person and life of Jesus 